The team travels 321 kilometers north, up the coast, to the small mill town of Powell River. This region's oral history casts doubt on the official version of Malahat sinking in Barclay Sound. Dropping down on the site, you're immediately struck with the reality of just how badly deteriorated this shipwreck is. No doubt a result of the wood-consuming worms that are so common in salt water. We really had our work cut out for us. We had to go on a hunt for those tiny little details that would definitely identify this wreck as the Malahat. One of the first things that was obvious, and something that you were almost drawn to, were these struts that were holding a large bearing. I recognized immediately that this would have been the bearing that held a propeller shaft. And on further investigation, I could see there was two of them. We now knew with certainty we had a wooden ship that was powered by twin propellers. That was great evidence of Malahat. But could we find evidence that this wreck was also a sailing ship? That was our next step. One of the objectives of the dive is to determine the wreck's length. The Malahat was 74 meters long. Well, Jacques laid out the tape measure to get an overall length of the site. I decided to swim towards what should have been the bow. I wanted to get a, a really good sense of just how the wreck lay on the bottom. And as I swam forward down that essentially the spine of the ship. I got the sense that I was an underwater paleontologist and I was investigating the remains of an old dinosaur. And in effect, that's what we were doing. We were, we were trying to find those, those little bits amongst the broken bones that would resurrect this vessel as the Malahat. Traveling down what would have been the Kielsen or the interior keel of the ship. I was really struck with just truly how large this vessel was. One of the more interesting three-dimensional components of the site were what we believed to be fuel tanks. Since we had really good drawings and measurements from Malahat, we realized that tanks could in effect become a, a signature that could only be matched to one ship. If we could measure the tanks and we could prove that they could fit theoretically below the decks of Malahat, then we had one more piece of mounting evidence. When Mike returned from his dive, he told me that he'd found a strut and tanks. This was an indication that we were looking at a vessel that wasn't just a sailing ship, but a vessel that had made use of a motor or an engine. That was pretty key, because Malahat had been built as an auxiliary schooner. She carried motors as a backup. The tanks, if they were fuel tanks, were going to be critical evidence. I now needed to go down to the bottom and take a look with the team, not just to map and measure it all in, but also to take a detailed look at just exactly what was there. Along with those obvious features, there had to be other critical diagnostic pieces of evidence that could tell us we were on Malahat. With this second dive, the team hopes to add to the archaeological data gathered during Mike's initial survey of the wreck. 
dropping down to the wreck, it was clear that we were looking at a large wooden vessel that had been fitted with propellers. Measuring the strut which supported the propellers, I was struck by the fact that these were rather small. This was not a ship that depended upon the propeller as the central means of propulsion. The evidence suggested that we were looking at an auxiliary schooner, a ship that used engines only as an assist. Swimming along the side of the hull, we mapped and measured in the location of the chain plates. Chain plates are a big, flat strap of iron bolted to the side of a ship that support the stays or the rigging that holds a mast in place. The number of chain plates on the side of a hull tells you how many masts a ship had. And the way the chain plates are spaced one after the other shows you how many stays there were and what kind of lines connected to the mast. And that tells you what type of rig. Looking at the wreck on the bottom, we found five chain plates. And the way they were spaced indicated that we were on a schooner. Everything we saw on the bottom matched up exactly with what we knew about Malahan. We also found fuel tanks on the bottom. The tanks and the struts were large things that would not have been stripped out. But there was evidence that the vessel had been stripped just the same. We couldn't find much in the way of artifacts. The only artifact that hinted at any human activity aboard the ship was a lone remnant, a cup that we found on the bottom. It would have been great to have found some bottles of whiskey or some other evidence of her days on Rum Row that had been hidden in the bilges only to be forgotten and then survive the years as a logging barge and as a wreck. But the only evidence of drinking we found was this cup. When we're down on the bottom looking at a ship or a shipwreck, what we're doing is not just getting an impression, we're taking exact detailed measurements that we can then match up with the historical record. The right size for a motor vessel like Malahat. In fact, they matched identically. Documenting the ship meant not just measuring one set of features like the tanks, it meant moving along the entire length of the wreck, mapping, documenting each feature that we found. Bit by bit, piece by piece, we gathered the details that we need to come to a conclusion. The evidence that suggested this was Malahat boiled down to the fact that this wreck was a wooden auxiliary schooner as long as Malahat. And we could tell that from the length of the wreckage from the stern at the struts to the bow, where we found a hawse pipe where the anchor chain would have passed out of the hull. The chain plates, which showed that this had been a five-masted vessel, and the spacing of the chain plates that showed that the rig was that of a schooner. The other measurements showed how large the timbers had been, and these measurements, like those of the struts and the tanks, matched the surviving plans. All of this evidence, collected systematically and scientifically, gave us a real sense that if this wasn't Malahat, it was one of her sister ships. So given what you've seen on the bottom today, is there anything that indicates that this is uh, potentially one of those steamer class of vessels that were built uh, concurrently in the United States, those, those wooden vessels? Definitely not, John. We've got clear length that's which is what, what John knew. 74 meters. 74 meters, that's, and the frames are huge. Um, iron fastened, big softwood construction, auxiliary motor sailor, looks like a schooner rig. Um, everything I'm seeing, you're seeing. We've got a vessel that is of the, uh, the right length, right dimensions, right. obviously some sort of auxiliary powered vessel. Uh, five chain plates, just five masts. Everything we're seeing on the bottom sure looks like one of those Mabel Brown class Canadian built motor sailing vessels right. from the First World War.
this looks like Malahat. I just, there's nothing that has a name on it down there. Though, I mean, the only thing that will conclusively nail it is something in the archives. But if we don't find that, I still feel, you know, that's the ma somehow that's the Malahat sitting down there. So what's the next logical step? I think it's to dig in the archives. Although the team is satisfied with the data they have added to the historical records of this wreck, they're disappointed that their information has been inconclusive and the wreck remains a mystery. Nevertheless, for the sea hunters, visiting this site and diving this fascinating shipwreck is its own reward. But then, things take a sudden and dramatic turn. Out of nowhere, and to everyone's great surprise, a long-hidden clue, perhaps the final piece of the puzzle, unexpectedly emerges. In underwater archaeology, you're always looking for a smoking gun to identify a ship. A bell, a nameplate, something that says, yes, this is it. Oftentimes, in the absence of that type of concise documentation, you're left with some element of doubt. You match everything up scientifically, bit by bit. Maybe it's the right size, the right shape, and in the right place, and all the pieces come together and you feel, yes, this is it. But you never know for certain. In the case of the wreck at Powell River, though, the dives and the discovery of the telegram found in the basement archives clearly stated that Malahat had not come to an end at Barclay Sound, but had been brought around to Powell River where it had been sunk. That's all we needed. That was the smoking gun. That piece of paper put Malahat exactly at Powell River and showed us that the vessel on the bottom that had matched in every other circumstance was indeed Malahat, the queen of Rum Row. The history books were wrong, and thanks to archaeology and a fortunate discovery in the archives, we'd put the final piece of the puzzle together and had closed the book with new information that clearly said this was the end of the fabled Malahat.